Hey, a pleasant good day, everybody. This is the Sports Fanatic News' latest NHL check-in edition as we are here on the Edmonton Oilers at the holiday break that is starting early. Right now, there is still a game between Vegas and Tampa uh, for tonight. We'll see if that ends up happening. Uh, but we're here to recap the Edmonton Oilers season this far, pretty much the quarterly report, because every team's between 25 to 30-ish games other than yeah. the teams that damningly affected by COVID. Uh, so... Uh, Peyton, first and foremost, as we start uh, recapping the Oilers season this far, how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. Uh, I've been working a lot, but uh, doing pretty good uh, as it's Christmas time. So it's always a jolly, holy time of the year. So excited about that. And how are you doing, bud? Doing well, doing well. You can probably see it's a little, it's tough on the thing, but there we go. If I bring this down. Oh, yeah. You can see the nice. tree in the corner back here. Yeah. Um, it's tough with the way Skype cuts off the... Um, video and all that type of stuff but um your Edmonton Oilers though they're in a better spot still than when I did the video with John where I think they're three points out the Boston Bruins yeah was three points out from the wild card your Oilers are three points into the wild card uh yeah. even with struggling so at least you got that going for you but from watching your OGRs I hear on top of the coach talk which we'll get to later in the video but depth is something you tend to address a lot where you're not getting the depth scoring. What, what, what's your take on, one, how you can fix that just being a in the GM's footsteps right now, but also, two, who are guys you think should be doing more to add to that depth scoring also? Well, first of all, I'll go over, I guess, a few stats of this year. Um, our goal share percentage of our depth has been 24.3%. We have nine goals for and 28 goals against from our depth so Which far this year. And that was a few games back on like December 20 or 14. So it has gotten better. We have seen some depth goal scoring with, you know, Fogel jumping up high in the lineup. But that's still, he's playing alongside of McDavid. Um, I, I think the biggest struggle with that depth is just the way that the lineup combinations are. Um, we're playing similar types of players alongside of each other, like Fogel and Cassian. Um, that's been kind of a popular lineup that Tippett seems to like to play. Uh, it was between Fogel, Ryan, and Cassian, or you know, submitting McLeod into that spot. Which you know, McLeod has been a breath of fresh air for us. You know, seeing him as a big depth piece, he's just you know not producing a whole lot. But we're not asking McLeod to produce a whole lot. He's more of your two-way guy. Um, but it's hard to say what's to really fix with this depth. I think it's just Tippett playing these guys that don't score goals. We have Devin Shore and Brendan Perlini and Kyle Turris and all these guys that really do not belong in the NHL. If these guys were playing on the Tampa Bay Lightning or the Toronto Maple Leafs or any other team that was a bit deeper than us, these guys wouldn't be in the NHL. And you could see that, you know. Um, Cooper Marodi and Tyler Benson and Seth Griffith, they've been called up and actually been playing quite well. Benson, I know he hasn't produced any points, but he's been playing alongside a tourist and Devin Shore. We're not giving the guys that we do have as offensive contributors yeah, chances to get offense. When they're next to, you can't judge somebody when they're playing. And also with Derek Ryan and uh, Colton Skeever, who obviously plays good, like you said, two-way game. You can throw Skeever into that, but doesn't yeah. produce points. You're not going to get Tyler Benson any points playing with those two. No, you're really not. And the way that we're seeing this depth, this is the worst depth I have seen this year. And it's that's saying a lot because I've seen a lot of bad depth with the Shirelli era and especially with this Holland era. And this is the worst. We're not seeing any offense. Anytime you see that depth go out there, we've been seeing, you know, absolutely horrible games. Uh, the last game against Kraken though, like we actually probably seen one of our best depth games. Um, the way that the combinations were, uh, I was loving to see Marodi. He got his first point in, uh, in his first game in the NHL, and he was looking amazing with the only six minutes that he played. Uh, Skeevy are starting to really pop off a little bit, especially with how he played in that last game. And same with Perlini. But the thing is, is we have a bunch of guys that are tweeners. We don't actually have dedicated guys. We traded one of our better defensemen and Ethan Bear for a guy, Warren Fogle, who's been very meh in the depth side. He's been horrible to say the least in the depth side until now where he's actually playing really well alongside of McDavid. Yeah. So there needs to be some major changes in their depth because what we're seeing I right now like is goes to your David Tibbet comment though, too, because similarly to how AV kind of buried Oscar um, yeah. when he was here with the uh, flyers, I kind of thought from watching 
Edmonton, he just, even though he wasn't playing well, there's no, putting guys with Derek Ryans in the world is not going to get their confidence going offensively. You have to do what you just did recently, and then you saw Fogel respond. So I feel like that's a little bit on coaching as well. Yeah, I, I think that's that, that's that's the biggest thing with this team this year um, has been coaching. Like, this team has not been very coached very well. If you watch some of my other oh, reaction videos, uh, I'm not a big fan of the coaching job with this team. Uh, he's too stubborn. He keeps the same lineup combinations the same when things aren't working. And he plays players that shouldn't be playing. Turs played 17 games when he shouldn't have been playing any this year. We've seen a horrible year like last year. Minutes. Yeah, and right? played teens minutes in a lot of those games. You should play like maybe seven minutes if you have him in the game. Well, so. like we have Cooper Marodi, who's 25 years old now, who's, I mean, you see him in Bakersfield. He's been playing amazing mm-hmm. for the Condors. He's been one of their main contributors over the past few years and for some reason hasn't been able and to one give of the, the leaders chance. Of the team. Right? Yeah. yeah, he's been the big guy and we haven't even given him a chance in the NHL. Until now, where we are dealing with COVID and dealing we with some also picked him actually. Our team was the team that picked him in 2015. Yeah. So he, he's a guy that I hope does get a chance and actually gets a chance to impress. And he's good. The The way that I seen him in that first game, he looked really good. I was really impressed. He's, he's not a bad skater. He has a good shot. He knows what he's doing offensively out there. And we need more depth guys like that. We need guys that know how to play offense. Not guys like Devin Shore, who seems to do nothing out there. Derek Ryan has been very rough this year. And I just feel like Dave Tippett's not giving them that confidence to do anything out there. Because from what I've seen in the last few games, I'm actually seeing confidence out of the depth. But now, during the first 20 games of the year, I wasn't seeing any confidence out of that depth. They were just getting shelled in. They weren't showing any of that until these past two games where we're actually seeing a bit more confidence out of that depth and just Dave Tippett's just not doing enough to give them that confidence to, you know, to start producing and also having good lineup combinations. I think that's also another big thing with that depth. Yeah. And I think when you have depth, it's good to have speed, but when you have guys like Torres who, yes, they can, when they're healthy, they can scale a little bit, but they don't have anything else from the past injuries. Their injuries have completely taken apart their career and he's, Really, a, a, kind of like how Ladd until this year with Arizona looks like he's more of an AHL player at uh, this point of his career. Where when you look at someone like Benson, it doesn't make sense to me why he's always on the bottom six when Brandon Perlini sometimes gets pushed into the top six because Brandon Perlini's a guy, again, skates fine for about 20, yeah, probably less than 20 seconds. And then, like, he just like looks like he's done like oh yeah like he's one of those he's one of those guys that when you watch him coming up you looked at the skill that he had that's why Pirlo talks about on show sometimes but like it's just something that seems like there's not that extra gear to get him to be the player that people thought he could be and for some reason like Perlini is playing a higher up in the lineup than Benson like the night where Uh we lost Hyman Perlini was playing (laughs) Perlini was playing alongside a dry sidle in Yamamoto and that line was horrible throughout the night why not throw Benson alongside a dry saddle in Yamamoto? Benson is was Pellini looking amazing. The new Cahoon? Is Pellini the new right? Dominic like, Cahoon? They're just going to keep him up in the lineup that, until it all It just work. doesn't make any sense why we're relying on these dumb depth pieces that we pick up for dirt cheap and we rely on them more than our youngsters that we're developing or trying to develop. Ken Holland praises this development of players but we're looking like we're doing such a horrible job of it. Example of last year where we benched Bouchard for half of the season. Mm-hmm. And he was playing amazing, but yet we, you know, we're going to play Barry 20 minutes yeah. a game and he's going to make countless mistakes, more mistakes than Bouchard. And even now they still play Barry more than Bouchard at some moments of time. And it, it, it boggles my brain. The reason why we make these types of coaching decisions where we're going to play our depth you know, our veteran leadership more than our youngsters who are playing better than our veteran leadership. I think if you want leadership, you want players who can play good. You want players who lead by example. You don't want these old guys playing on your team when they, they're when they're not doing anything. You want guys no. who bring leadership and actually play good hockey. For example, like Leon Dreisaitl, who came out to the ice training an hour before the team practice to get everything ready to go and get in his one-timer set up and ready to go you want leadership like that sometimes veteran leadership is good but you got to be able to play Mm -hmm. 
And, I mean, before he went down with COVID protocol, we saw that here in Philly where since Yo took over, he really has instilled confidence in someone like Wilman, who's an undrafted player, where yeah. he has speed and he has the not-care attitude of, even though he's a smaller guy with speed, going to the dirty areas, that he kind of pisses off the other team that way. It seems like Yo's going to go with those types of players. But, like, for me, like, you have a guy that has – like, a guy like Tyler Benson – can move a little bit, move up the lineup, has some offensive skill, also has a little bit of agitator to him. Why yeah. is Brandon Perlini playing it? But like, like that, that doesn't like you have a guy that is going to just not just by his skill, but by protection baseline, if he's with Dre, also protect one of the star players. Cause it's not like you really want Leon Dreisaitl fighting somebody. Not that he can't yeah. if he wants to, but you don't want him fighting somebody. So it's like, I think that also helps. I agree with you looking at Edmonton, and I've heard Pirlo talk about it some too, but like looking at some of the ways they do the line combinations, and I think he said it too. It's like Dave Tippett looks at it and goes, how can I make this the most difficult for this human being that I can make him be try to be the best he can be because he's on a line that makes fractionally no sense whatsoever, so he's going to have to basically be that Mick Jesus of that line and just be like, yeah, okay, screw my line mate. I am just taking this all upon myself to get the puck up the ice. Like Evan Bouchard at times this year, for example, when he's with Tyson Berry and he makes a mistake and almost takes the puck from his own teammate so he can then get the damn puck up the ice. That's not something you want to really consistently see. We saw with Yandel's line a bit here in Philly too. Those are not things you like Ew. to see to <laughs> give you confidence from your defense. But I think something we have to get to what the Edmonton Oilers team, Peyton, is we all know that oh, your power plays first. We all know everything can get done there when it comes to the power play. But a big issue with this team has been finding the success on the five and five play. And I think that's because you have Nuge, you have Dre, you have Pooley Arby, who's been very good, just come back from overseas. But guys like Yamamoto and others you expect to step up on five and play five, excuse me, have been underperforming this year. So what's your take on why you think the five on five play? other than depth um, has been like so scarce. Do you think it's because you have a young player like Yamamoto kind of being like your TK that's not playing as well as you would expect him to? Well, I think from what I've watched since Tippett has came to this team now, yeah, our five on five game has definitely been horrendous. Like you watch the, you watch our power play and you're like, Oh man, this team must be really good. And then, you know, they kill off the power play and you see us, on five on five and it's just a completely different game and I, I don't even know how to uh explain it but for the fact that watch the game you see so much energy on the power play and it just looks like it just gets sucked out of us when we have to play five on five um I, I think this team without a doubt should be great five on five we have the players we have the capability of being a great five on five team um I think for the fact that we suck at breaking it out first of all uh, when you put Keith and CC alongside of each other and expect those guys to break it out of the zone, yeah, good luck. Not gonna work too <laughs> good well, luck. Yeah. When you put Nurse and Barry, good luck trying to get that puck because you're never going to get it. Once you get it, yeah, you're going to be able to break it out of the zone, but good luck getting that puck. The way that the way that the, these lines are built is the biggest problem, I think, with the five-on-five five. and the way that Dave Tippett employs the five-on-five five team of this. Yabamoto... When he first came to the team, he was offense. His analytics, all it shows now is defense. It's like Tippett is trying to force these guys to play more of a defensive mindset when we shouldn't. <laughs> like, this should not be a defensive team. We're, we should be an all-offensive team. Why is Yamamoto playing more defense than he is offense? Because Yamamoto, his first year in, was a point-per-game player and was playing absolutely amazing. Sure, players are picking up on him a little bit more now, playing a little bit harder on Yamamoto, which we have been seeing that. But, I mean, these past two games, Yamamoto is playing amazing, especially when you give him some good chances and you allow him to be offensive and giving him some power play time. I think that's also a big thing. Like, why is the second unit of the power play with Cal Turris and all these other guys when, you know, we should be giving some big opportunities to Yamamoto up on the top power play unit or whatever it may be? But this five on five, Sim park himself in front of the net than Kyle Tours at this point on the power right? play too. Yeah, right. like it made no sense to me to why we we're having Kyle Tours every time he plays a game on the power play because he can't handle the puck. And that's another big thing. Like you look at our depth, who's going to handle the puck? Who's going to break out uh, out of the zone when we're stuck in? Is it going to be Devin Shore? Pfft, no, 
He's old defense. Cal Turs, oh, he can't even handle the puck anymore. You got Brendan Perlini, who can't even skate that well. Skivier and McLeod are only really two good solid depth pieces, and Derek Ryan, right? Like, you don't got a lot of good guys. To and Skivier and McLeod are, again, more defensive players than offensive yeah. players. So you're not going to ex- want the, you don't expect them to be the breakout of the zone guys. You expect them to be the take the puck off of the tape of the other team and then get it to somebody else who is going to break it out of the zone. It, it, yeah, and that's the biggest problem is just we have a defensive core which is not very well built built together, um, especially with playing CC and Keith, the two slowest defensemen alongside of each other, which don't make any sense to me. Um, I think our biggest thing is that we struggle to break it out of the zone and we struggle to play defense and we struggle to maintain the puck and we also struggle to shoot. There's a lot of times where I watch the game and I'm like waiting for us to shoot the puck and we just keep passing it. We should be shooting a lot more. We should be, you know, playing smarter. We should be doing quick passes instead of these long stretch passes, which I, which I've been seeing a lot this year. There's a lot, lot, a lot of stuff to improve upon this five on five. And uh, I know people will always probably say, "Oh, don't we don't need to fire Tippett? We do. <laughs> Tippett it just does not belong with this team. He does not know how to coach these young guys. I think we've always seen it with Dave Tippett how he's not been able to coach young players, and we're seeing it with the Edmonton Oilers pretty badly. Yeah, I mean, in order to pick up 5 on 5 I agree, you have to have guys like um, Yamamoto going. Uh, you have to obviously uh, not overstack your line sometimes too much and let guys like Nugent Hopkins play with other guys to try to get them going on the third pairing. At time. So, like, there's different things you can do where Tibbet yeah. either overstacks at times or decides before the game to put in the wrong guy over somebody that you probably should put in the game. That's a younger player that's been playing better of late, whether um, that is a Marodi or if that um, is even just like a player. He hasn't been playing that great, but if he say does, it's a really good game physically that Nima line and kid on defense uh, there, or you have a guy like McLeod, you should keep the young kids in if they're playing well. Cause like you said, it adds that extra energy to the team to kind of follow and grab on their bootstraps and say, well, if this kid's going to the dirty areas and this kid's like, doing this, um, what excuse do I have to not do it myself? I've been in this league for six damn years. Like, like that, that kind of rubs off, which we saw it rub off with the Flyers a bit. When Wilman started doing it, you saw guys like JVR play the most aggressive they have all season where he's looked obsolete most of the season, where then, like, you saw, like, so, like, those things rub off if you kind of play the younger guys more because of just an unexplicable energy thing. But from what you were saying, I think the Oilers are a perfect example of how you obviously, we both love stats and using the stats, but you obviously have to watch the game to understand it, too, because if you just look at the stats, you say, oh, this team's one of the best teams. And they, they have the six best goals per game, but most of that's because of the power play production, not five on five. They have the 12th most shots on goal, but like you said, when you watch the game, you see opportunities they still don't take to to shoot it on goal. So they're a perfect example of a team that if you just broadline, don't pay attention to the game and look at the stats, you'd be like, oh, this team has a chance to be a cup contender as long as they solve their defense. But that's not really the, the case because you would have to get more depth and, of course, uh, solve the defense that the way that is structured there as well. So for me, uh, my other question to you is I asked this to John, if you mm-hmm. were, you kind of already answered the coaching side of it, but what would like two or three things be that you would do as the coach in order to adjust this to get the team moving in the best direction? And what would two to three things be that you would do as the GM of the team if you were in the GM shoes, Holland shoes? Uh, I wouldn't be so stubborn with lineups. You know, I think we got to try whatever we can to get that depth going. Um, I I had an idea of, why do we always need to stack that top line? It, it reminds me so much of Tom McClellan near the end of his era where we put, you know, McDavid, Drysdale together. It's 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 dumb. You know, some games it's all right, you know, for a few shifts it's all right. But teams predict it now. Teams know how to defend that now. And we've been seeing that, obviously. And when we stack that line up, it weakens every single other lineup. The dynamite line between New Drysdale and Yamoto has not been working. We need to try something new. Um, one of my ideas, and we haven't tried it ever, is to do McDavid, Drysdale, Nuge right down the center. Have McDavid as your top line, Drysdale as your second line, and Nuge as your third line. I'm not saying that Nuge is a third liner, but we have the chance to make a really, really deep lineup and maximize our potential. We have some really good guys. It's just we have no depth 
offensive guys, and I think Nuge could really be that guy for us and play some good third line minutes. Not even just that, why don't we try Nuge back up on the top line or whatever it may be? I think we got to try some different things in that lineup. Defensively, we got to stop playing CC and Keith together. I was kind of proposing Nurse and CC play alongside of each other. I don't know who you're going to play alongside of Keith is the toughest part because he really can't play defense. So do you really want him to play alongside of Bouchard? No, not really. Do you want him to play alongside of Barry? Hell no. You do not no, want yeah. that, right? So it, <laughs> it, it kind of, you, now you're like trying to decide what you want to do because CC is definitely the best partner for Keith because he's the only guy that can actually play defense. I mean, Bouchard can as well, but you just don't want to play Bouchard alongside of Keith. That's just going to really. You don't want to put that much pressure on a young guy to play alongside of a veteran that's at the twilight at, the, at this point. Yeah. That's there more for his leadership capabilities than his on ice capabilities at this point. And for, you know, trading and all that, I think we need to get rid of Barry. I think we need to maximize Barry's potential here and get rid of him. He's been horrible this year. Um, he's been horrible defensively, even his offensive game. I don't know why we're not playing Bouchard up on the top power play as well. I think our power play could be 100% better without Barry on that power play as well. And I know, you know, people will always say that, oh, you know, our power play is best in the league. Yeah, but it could always improve. It was the same as last year. I was praising that we got to take off Chase on and Neil. Once we took those guys off and we put Hyman and Pulley look at us now. Our power play has been the best. If we take Barry off that power play and put Bouchard there, without a doubt, the power play without a doubt would be the best in the league. And it already is. It'd be even better. Um, for trading, Barry needs to get gone. We need a left-handed defenseman to play in the top four. I would love to be seeing Chikrin uh, as our top four defenseman. Uh, instead of Duncan Keith, because he really does not belong as a top four defenseman in Keith. No, he's a third pairing uh, oh, defenseman. E even then, <laughs> um, I, I would love to see us pick up a top four defenseman, but the chances of that happening is very, very slim. Uh, and then we need depth. I, I think that's definitely something that we need to add. We need to add depth. Uh, and of course, fire Tippett. I don't care what a record is. I don't even care if it's a good record. Tippett, does, he's just not the right coach for this team. And I will praise that every single day, no matter what people say. Uh, I, I think uh, Woodcroft would be a better coach for us right now, uh, who is the head coach for the Condors in our system, um, who's actually gotten something out of Benson, who made Marodi the player that he is right now, um, who made Perlini. I mean, when Perlini went down to the AHL, he was popping off. It seems like Woodcroft is able to get something out of players that Dave Tippett seems to not be able to get out of our depth right now. And I think Woodcroft would just be a better replacement for the team than Dave Tippett. Yeah, yeah, I think um, we're starting to see, too. Obviously, you saw John Cooper is the prime example of a successful AHL coach that then figured it yeah. out in the NHL to the ultimate winning back-to-back -back Stanley Cups. Uh, but we've seen it with other guys that have got it done as well. So, yeah, I think um, when you're able to pull the most out of your guys down there, it makes sense to – promote from within in, the, in that instance because he has these guys that he's been able to get it done with and that's what Cooper was able to do he had the connection with those guys then got promoted then still kept the same connection with those guys but just now at the pro level to then developing their game and letting them putting them in the right spots and saying I still got your back no matter what but now we have to do it this way because we're at the pros or what have and adjust that way and we saw how well that worked so I think it would make sense to uh, promote from within in, in that instance as well um but as we wrap up this episode, I'm not sure if there's any final um, thoughts you had on the Edmonton Oilers and their team. I guess the last thing I probably should ask you is, goaltending-wise, um, what have you felt about, one, Stuart Skinner kind of coming into his own a bit this year, and two, uh, the fact that you've been able to kind of keep it at bay with Miko Koskinen a lot more than usual? Uh, Koskinen, I mean, I've always, I've always praised Koskinen. And, um, now, he's not no phenomenal goalie, nothing at that. Um, he's been respectable this year. I think he's been holding down the Ford, especially with our horrendous defense. I know you might look at it and you're like, oh, he's has a 902 save percentage and a 3.16 goals against average. You really need to watch the games because Koskinen has definitely been pretty solid for the team. It's just the defense hasn't bailed him out. Uh, with Stuart Skinner, I know what they're going to do. They're going to ride him. They're going to be throwing him back down in the AHL when they shouldn't. I think Skinner belongs in the NHL right now. He's playing like an NHLer, and he deserves to be at least either a backup or maybe even a fringe starter because Skinner, 
has been looking like an NHL goalie this year. Uh, he's been doing really well, uh, played really well against the crack. Even, even though he lit in a week one, he played really strong throughout the end of the game. Stuart Skinner has been really strong and I've been really impressed with him and he's been phenomenal. And my final thoughts, honestly, um, hopefully this team will improve five on five. I think that's the biggest thing uh, up and coming. I want to see this team improve five on five and, and see the team improve depth wise as well. Uh, and hopefully I get to see that either that or I'll be, I guess, freaking out on more of my, <laughs> my videos again. Yeah, no, I think when you improve too, we talk about fun, fun, but defensively, when you make some of the acquisitions, you said you see all these teams like Boudreaux's team, like he's always been touted as an offensive coach, but he talked about when he came in with the Canucks. I'm not just about offense. I'm about getting in your face and being aggressive on the other end to then lead to the offense. So if you bring in Bakersfield, that's kind of like, because they're an in the middle team in the AHL. They're not a great team, but they're not a no. bad team either. But the reason why I think they're in the middle is not because they're stacked. It's because of the coaching, like you said, yeah. where they do have that kind of in your face, like screw you, I'm going for the puck and then pushing it this the other way. Where that mentality, I think, would be great for the Edmonton Oilers because you have players, like even if Broberg's up, who has had success with the Condors, he's a defenseman that you can use that aggressive, screw you, I'm taking it from you, and then I can pass it to the next. We've seen it with Bakersfield. It seems like it might be to the point of let your AHL coach come in like Cooper did with the Tampa Bay Lightning, and he'll get the most of these guys now. And if you don't win it this year, you're going to see great progress in next season and the following season to be able to then get there because he's going to get the most out of the Moralities and might find Cooper Morality to be the next Pat, not, not necessarily winning back to back cup, but being the next Patrick Maroon that nobody thought would be anything. Yeah. And then uh, would actually turn into a solid NHL player. So I think that's a solid take. Um, definitely by you. I wasn't thinking we would be going with the Condors coach getting promoted <laughs> in this podcast, but I do think that is a very solid take just from how they played and got the most out of these guys that you're not seeing enough from, under Dave Tibbet, like the McLeods of the world has been good. But even with the Condors, you see a little bit more, like he's more of a defensive player, but you see the, like at this point of his career in the NHL Silverberg type moments where it's like, okay, if you put him with the right people, he can still get the puck to a guy that can pot it. And then you, where you don't see that necessarily with Tibbet because he puts him in just defensive positions. He puts Yamamoto in just yeah, defensive uh, positions. Even, like even Yamamoto did really good in Bakersfield with Woodcroft. Mm -hmm. 16 points in 23 games. Like, Yamamoto produces really well with Woodcroft. And I, I definitely think it's definitely something that Holland has to think about. I know it might not happen this year. But if we get eliminated in the first round again, I think we have to see Dave Tippett getting fired. You can't, with this type of team, play this poorly five on five. And not just that get eliminated in the first round countless years because we play really poorly five on five. So I think I think that's has to be taken into account this year is with the head coaching. Yeah, no, exactly. And I think another thing is, too, he's also a big reason why I think Stuart Skinner has been able to get his confidence level to where it is now and develop in yeah. the minors as well, working with his goaltenders, coaches. I remember it was like over a month ago at this point, but he complimented how well McLeod and Skinner were doing to earn their uh, calls to being uh, stays with the Oilers now. So mm -hmm. uh, he has a great pulse on the team. I think Jay uh, Woodcroft would make sense. But I thank you for joining, Peyton. I uh, thank everybody for watching. Have a happy holiday season. The NHL, unless if Vegas does kick off tonight, will be back on December uh, 27th, or Vegas will play tonight still um, against the Tampa Bay Lightning is the last game before the holiday break. Stay safe mm -hmm. out there, everybody. Enjoy the holidays. This has been the Edmonton Oilers quarterly slash holiday report with Payton on the radio. Follow him on his YouTube, too. Does great content at Payton on the radio. And subscribe down below uh, as well. Stay safe, everybody, and peace out.